Hey there, I'm Drew and you are listening to or watching the anxious truth. This is the podcast that covers all things anxiety, anxiety disorders and anxiety recovery. So if you're struggling with things like panic attacks, agoraphobia or OCD, this is the place for you and I'm happy that you're here. This week on the podcast, we're going to talk about addiction, because I know many in this community are not only struggling with anxiety, but maybe with alcohol or recreational drug use at the same time. So let's get into that now. Hello, everybody, welcome back to the anxious truth. This is podcast episode number 254 recorded in April of 2023. I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. And if this is your first time here at the podcast or the YouTube channel, welcome. I'm glad you found us. And I hope you find it helpful. If you're a returning listener or a returning viewer, welcome back. I'm glad that you're here again. This week on the podcast, we're going to talk about something that we really haven't talked about before, because I know we need to. I know that quite a few people in this community, not only are struggling with anxiety and anxiety recovery, but may also be struggling with alcohol or drug abuse. Sometimes this happens because it becomes a self medicating strategy that sort of goes off the rails. And for a variety of reasons, you may find yourself confronted not with one problem, anxiety, but with two problems, anxiety and drinking or anxiety and drugs. And I know that it's a big problem for many of you. And I know that it's a problem that doesn't get talked about enough. And I know that it's something that people are a little bit reluctant to talk about because there's shame and stigma attached to that. And it feels like having two problems is way worse than having one. So today I asked my friend Adam Jablin to join us. Adam I met not too long ago, and he works in that recovery space in terms of drug and alcohol addiction because he has lived that experience. He's kind, he's knowledgeable, he has been there and done that. And there are many parallels between anxiety recovery and treatment of an alcohol or drug problem. And today is the first of probably quite a few conversations I will have with Adam here on this podcast where we will talk about those things and how they overlap. So if this is something that you have been waiting to hear about, I'm glad that you're here today. And we're going to start that conversation in an open, honest, and I hope a kind and compassionate way. And before we get into it and bring Adam on just a very quick reminder that the anxious truth is more than just this podcast episode, there are a ton of really helpful use useful resources on my website at theanxioustruth.com. You can go check that out at your convenience, take advantage of all the resources. And if you're enjoying this work, and it's helping you in some way, all the ways to support it can be found on the website at the anxious truth.com slash support. Financial support is never required, but always appreciated. Thank you very much in any way that you do support this work, whether it's subscribing to the YouTube channel or leaving a podcast review. Thank you very much. I appreciate it more than you will ever know. So let's get Adam on. Adam's great. He is somebody that I trust to talk about this topic. And I think he was a great choice to open up the conversation on a, on a thing that we have waited far too long to talk about. So let's get to Adam's uh, interview. It goes for about a half hour. And then I will come back as always to wrap it up in the end. Adam, welcome, dude. My brother, thank you for having me round two. Round two. For those of you who do not know, Adam and I met on Instagram. And we totally hit it off. We did an IG live on Adam's account. And it was so much fun that cool. uh, I, I had to have him on the podcast. It was a blast. It was a blast. And I'm honored to be on your show. And man, did we have a good talk or what? I mean, I got so much good response from that IG live. I drew, it was it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. It was a great conversation. I really enjoyed yeah. doing it. So um, one of the things that I want to talk about, and, and I'll let you get kind of give your backstory for sure. But I know that there is a large number of people in my community that are struggling with substance use at the same time that they're struggling with anxiety. Yeah. One came before the other. It doesn't matter. Sometimes they sort of stumble into the self-medication thing. And you have such a positive outlook and you're so kind in the way you talk about these things. Uh, and it's no bullshit. You're, you're straight to the point. So this is why I dig you. And I thought you'd be a perfect person to talk about those sort of things. So that's why I invited you on because I, I totally trust you to talk about this stuff. So can give us the, uh, you know, give me the Reader's Digest version. Where you been? Where you go? Yeah, man, absolutely. Thank and by the way, thank you. I feel the same way about you. I told you I was devouring your content um, for months before even reaching out, and and um, and I, I just love how you speak about anxiety, about how you speak about what you went through with your own personal panic attacks, walk through it, and how you walk people through those 10, 12 steps that you and I even spoke about when I when we did off the cuff. Um, I uh, on July fourteenth. This of this year, I will be 17 years clean and sober. 
Oh man. Yeah, which I, I, I'm very proud of that date. July 14, 2006 was the day I surrendered and went to treatment. And I didn't, you know, look, Drew, I didn't really know what alcoholism and addiction was. Yeah. To me, an alcoholic was some bum in Manhattan, you know, that hadn't showered with a, with a paper, brown paper bag and a bottle in it, mumbling to himself, petting a cat that's not there, just kind of delusional. Yeah. Or, or an addict was like the, if you ever seen the movie New Jack City, it was like Chris Rock's character. It was somebody always you know, smoking crack or sticking needles in their arms and willing to sell their baby for their next fix. Right. And those were my definitions. So therefore, I didn't fit that, right? However, I abused alcohol. I abused drugs. Mm. Um, a lot of it for me did stem from anxiety and dot, 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 insecurity and dot, 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 curiosity. And when you mix those three up, especially as a young, young man, yeah. not having much fear and wanting to fit in, you know, and you have some anxiety and you have some insecurity and you have some curiosity and you put those in a, in a, in a nice round tub and a nice coarse light and you slam that back. And it just fixed something inside of me I didn't know was broken. I, I didn't know it was broken, but it fixed it. And all yeah. those old feelings and old traumas from being the fat kid growing up. And uh, still, even after I changed my body and I looked like an Adonis, you know, I was still that class clown comedian. Let me make you laugh with me instead of laughing at me. Always trying to make, always trying to make the, the room comfortable. But when I drank or I did drugs, a different confidence came out. Yeah. And, you know, so I would go on this anxiety, nervous, insecure, let me, my, let my muscles do the talking because I don't want them to see what, who I really am inside. And then when I would drink, Superman would come out. So, you know, I, I pushed that as, as far as I could take it. I go to Arizona State University. It was the number one party school oh, yeah. in, Play, in Penthouse and Playboy, which yeah. it was. And I dominated there and it was sex, drugs and rock and roll. And then it was right. Uh, I come from a, a, my family had a family business and family businesses, at least from my generation in the 80s, 70s, 60s, we were like the mafia. Like it wasn't like, hey, Adam, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be? It was like, this is who we are. This is what we do. We found our way. You're the next generation. Yeah. And it comes with obviously some security, but it also comes with a lot of emptiness because you don't ever dare to dream. And I worked hard. Uh, I had to be the first one there, last one to leave. Had to learn every department in a, is a 24 hour a day, 24 hour a day, seven day a week operation. Ma number one ma lace manufacturing plant in the world. Wow. Uh, over 110 machines, over 200 employees, either three eight hour shifts or two 12 hour shifts with a lot of overtime, depending on what was going on in the world. And mm -hmm. I had to learn, you know, literally from janitor, night shift, quality control, inventory, mechanic, knitting, uh, up to design. Um, I didn't even know what every secretary was doing, what kind of yarns they were pulling in, what kind of the inventory, how the goods were going out. Yeah. All so I could finally, you know, run the whole company. To fulfill your destiny. Was to that your choice? To fulfill my destiny. And yeah. it was work hard, play hard. And, yeah. you know, we would drink heavy. We would drink heavy. And then my ex-wife didn't like the drinking. So Xanax came in. Okay. And I couldn't sleep from anxiety and worry. And, and it, I, I, you know, I had this going on, I had that going on, I had this going on. I mean, I never really understood what running a full operation was, was like this. And so I'm taking Ambien to sleep. And, you know, then before you know it, I'm getting a little older and wear and tear and I get an ACL tear and I get, you know, ACL surgery and MCL surgery and they're giving me Oxycontin and I got Oxys and I got Percocets and I got Darvocets yeah. and I'm taking Ambien to sleep. I'm taking Xanax. And I'm taking fat burners before I work out and caffeine and ephedrine and, and, do, I, and drinking all the time. And I just became this pharmacist and I truly became an alcoholic and an addict. Yeah. I truly became that. But if you want to know where it really stemmed from, yeah. It stemmed from that anxiety and that insecurity of not being comfortable in my own skin. Yeah. Take away those feelings. Please. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. And, you know, you hear that often people, even if they don't have a substance use issue before they develop an anxiety disorder, a lot of people wind up turning to that because it is a self-medicating thing. So you hear those stories when people are 
you know, open enough to talk about them. And it's a very personal thing. So I don't expect anybody to talk about it. But um, sometimes you hear things like, oh, I, I accidentally discovered that I drink two bottles of wine every night. So yeah, and they didn't realize it crept up on them. And then they start to get into that. They feel backed into a corner. Now I have two problems. How do I address that? Yeah. So how do you go from, first of all, it sounds like a horrifying ride, my friend. Like you are literally trying to control every part of your body by ingesting different things to get higher and lower and sleep and wake up and fat burner in the gym. Man, I, I get that. Yeah. So where did you start when you hit that, that point where it's like, I, I can't do this anymore? What happened? Yeah. That's true. That's true. So there were many, many of those moments, right, where I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. But that next day comes and the obsessions of the mind start mm -hmm. and you got to get through the day and you only know that one way. Yeah. And then once you put the actual substance in your body, now you created the allergy and the compulsion. Yeah. Right. So your body needs more of it. So there were so many times I swore to myself, today I'm going to stop. Today is the last day. Okay. Tonight, this is the last pill with this last, this is the last time I drink on a Tuesday night. You know, it's only going to be eight nights or Friday and Saturday. I, mean, I can't tell you how many times I made these false promises and these, these ridiculous, you know, God, if you'll just do these foxhole prayers, you know, if you'll just take this away from me. Yeah. But it ended up getting to the point that I had to walk into an intervention. And yeah. you know, now there's a show and it's very popular. And I have friends that are actually on the show as interventions. I'm so proud of them. But to tell you the truth, in 2006, I didn't know what the hell an intervention was. Yeah. The show wasn't out. And what it really is, is you're walking into basically the people that love you the most gathering around and saying, you have a problem. Yeah. We love you. It's time for a timeout. Do you, will you accept help? Yeah. Um, I accepted the help Drew, but very defensively, like how am I 28 days? I can't go in for 28 days. Like it was going to be me for a month. Yeah. I'm running the, I'm running the, the business. I'm doing that. I'm, you know, I'm Mr. Big Shot. Yeah, I'm, I'm the man. Yeah. yeah. He's going to be the man if I'm not here. Yeah. And they saw it coming. Yeah. So they had, it. they had it prepared. And they're like, well, how about 10 days? Wow. What about 10 days, we'll see if you even have this thing, right? Yeah. And um, and and all of a sudden I start negotiating. Like, okay, 10 days, we can tell people I'm on a business trip. And and that was my bullshit, right? My bullshit barometer is I'm worried. I'm constantly anxious about what are people gonna think about me? What is the projection of me? How mm -hmm. is this gonna look? How is this gonna feel? I'm not really that concerned that the people that love me the most are are worried about my life. Yeah. I'm worried about the perception. Um, and that goes to show you where alcoholism and addiction can take somebody. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get that. In, Drew, I go in and um, I really, you know, what I went in with this attitude that I'm going to be the most dedicated, disciplined, structured rehab patient they've ever seen. And what, what they will see is there's really nothing wrong with this guy. He's under way too much pressure with a family business, with a wife that's always on him, with a new kid. There's yeah. nothing wrong with this man, right? And it backfired. And everything I learned made sense. And I learned what a real alcoholic is. Yeah. And I'm an alcoholic. And that I learned what a, an addict is. And I learned that alcoholism addiction is a disease. It's not a lack of willpower, which started to make sense because I have willpower all day. Yeah. I'll marathons, I'll squat 450 pounds, I'll make $2 million in a day. Will it, this has nothing to do with willpower. It's not, it's, it's got four qualifications to be considered a disease. You have to be progressive. Over time, you get worse. Yep. You have to be chronic. You always have to be there. You yep. have to be uh, primary, as in not secondary. You're the first cause, and you have to be fatal. Yeah. It has to be able to kill you. You take one of those away, it's a disorder. Yep. You add one, the, that fourth dimension back, it's a disease. So the yep. medical community considers alcoholism and addiction a disease. And I started learning that I was sick. I wasn't a bad person. I was sick. And that's why I got a DUI. And that's why I always lied about my drinking. And that's why I was always covering up. So now you take the symptom away, right? Yep. Now you take my baba away. You take the drink and drug away. And now we get to the anxiety. Now we get to go, why the hell am I always feeling like this? Yeah. Why am I suffering like this? 
and it's it's the work that you and I have discussed, you know, in in, in my Instagram live. It's, yeah. it's Although I really think that you could take that protocol and bring it to every treatment center I've ever spoken to. What you showed, you shared with me, but but it is that inside work. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because in, I claim no expertise in substance abuse counseling or anything like that, or even lived experience there. But I, I, I see there are overlaps. The more people I talk to that I do trust with this subject, the more you can see that there are some overlaps. So let me ask you a question. Maybe you can answer it, maybe you can't. When you would make those promises to yourself, this is my last Tuesday night, tomorrow, that's it, I'm clean tomorrow, and you get to noon and you haven't had anything yet, what do you experience? So it's almost as true, it's almost as if you're like multiple people at the same time. Okay. There's a part of your ego or a part of your personality that's kind of proud of you, right? Yeah. And that guy slowly turns into a, another voice that's like, you see, it's already noon, right? You could go another five hours if you had to. What's the big deal? You're always, you're, you're, you make this into such a thing. Have a Xanax, have a cocktail tonight, relax. You're not that bad. It's like this, it happened to me in rehab. The second I said I'm an alcoholic and an addict, this 600 pound gorilla literally came off my shoulders and I could breathe and everything made sense. It was like the movie, The Sixth Sense with Bruce Willis at the end. Yeah, when he realizes he's dead yeah. and it's like, oh. Oh, that's, that's what, what it is. Right, yeah. that's, what the, that's why he's telling me he can see dead people. That's why she she's eating alone. That's why like, well, that's what I was like. Oh, that's that's why I, I cover so so much. That's why I spent the night in jail. That's why I wrote thirty letters and I'll stop drinking. That's why I have a DUI. That's yeah. I'm an alcohol. But then within that minute, it was like. But now, what? Like, how do I watch football with my dad? How do I go out and entertain customers? Yeah. How do I go and do that? How do I go and do that? Because alcohol and and substances were such a part of my life. So what I'm trying to say is it's, it's, a, it's a very sneaky, sidious voice in my head that when I would make it to 12 o'clock, I would want a reward that I made it to 12 o'clock with the actual thing that I'm sustaining from. So yeah. it, it, it's, like, it's like you're crazy. Uh, well, I, I think a lot of people who are listening, even if you are, and I appreciate you sharing openly like this, man, I really do. But uh, the, there are a number of people who are listening right now that maybe don't have a substance use problem of any kind, but they understand what you're saying because it is the same thing that happens when somebody enters a disordered state of anxiety. Like, okay, I have to tolerate these feelings today. And you get into it a little bit. And then all of a sudden that voice starts to say, well, you, you know, you did a good exposure today. Go rest for a week. It's fine. You get, you deserve a break. So yeah, that other side chimes in. You're describing a very similar process here. The context is different, but the process is quite similar, I think. Yeah, and you yeah. know, that's why I think you and I could talk to many people because what I have found is people have that issue with food and people have this issue with gambling. Obviously, anxiety is true. Sure. Uh, you know, when you suffer from anxiety, you can't compare that to anything. For, to me, personally, anything. I'd rather have a broken arm than to have right. that internal, the, the internal... Um, but what I'm saying is that I do think more people understand that voice than don't understand it. Yeah, you're probably right. Whereas I think it's amazing that you had to be told, oh, you have a, you have this problem. You know, it's interesting. And the, the parallel in, in the anxiety recovery world would be that's the psychoeducational part. Like, no, no, let me explain what's going on with you. You're not broken. Your brain isn't broken. Like, this is what's going on. But only knowing, and I hear these parallels here that I can bring out as you talk, knowing is great. And knowing lifted that weight off your shoulders, but knowing wasn't enough. What had to go on top of knowing? So after you know what you are, it takes radical, radical action. For me, I was very blessed that they showed me the path, mm -hmm. right? And they showed me the steps in, in, in a way to get clean and sober. It was going to be a new way of living. It was going to be a new blueprint. Mm -hmm. I was going to have to change many things, friends, people, places I go, you know, entertaining customers. It was going to be a whole a whole new blueprint, but this way of life, I could be clean and sober. And in being clean and sober, I could actually find joy. I could actually be free. And when you have those two, eventually find true happiness, right? Because happiness is fleeting. 
You know, you could be happy when you get a new car a week later, that's just your car. You could yeah. be happy when you, you know, you fall in love, but a year and a half later, that's just your girl and, yeah. Yeah, or girl or partner, whatever. But, but joy and freedom are completely, are two complete other things. Like a literal, a joy for living, a joy that I could talk about anxiety with you yeah. compared to trying to show that I'm some superhero and that nothing bothers me. You know, yeah. there's a freedom within that. And uh, I had to change, you know, I had to change a lot, but everything I did was in, in such a beautiful, healthy way for my, for my lifestyle. Yeah. I love that uh, you're talking about joy and freedom. And it's interesting because again, in this community of people who are listening, everyone's trying to shoot for, I need to feel happy again. I need to feel joy. I need to feel gratitude again. They're trying to create experiences because they think that's the opposite of being anxious, but really the opposite of being anxious is, is contentment or neutrality. And what I hear you describing, and you tell me if I'm off base here is joy and freedom don't equate to nirvanic happiness. They basically, I'm going to guess that they equate to like, hey, whatever state I'm in at the moment is the state I'm supposed to be in. I'm good with that. And I'm going to let it all come and go. I'm not, I don't have to self-medicate to create a particular state. I can handle life as it is. And that's a joyful state, even though it might not be the technical definition of joyful of like, yay, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but there's a contentment and a confidence I'm guessing you must have found in that. Uh, I, I think the word, you, I love the words that you use. I like confidence i love neutrality yeah um i use the word joy because it was actually because it was taught to me sure right? so it's not even it's not even like but i like your words better there's a, there's a confidence in facing the day mm -hmm. knowing i could be clean and sober and there's a neutrality i can i can make a mistake and come back to neutral not oh i'm so grateful i made that mistake i you know no 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 but like i i learned i learned how to miss a shot like Jordan and Kobe and take it again. Yeah. Right? The old Adam was not. The old Adam missed a shot. Now I'm just gonna pass because I suck and I don't want to play anymore. And this is too hard. And you know, yeah. you know what I mean? But I learned how to come back to neutral. Yeah. And, and some of those lessons I'm guessing come through. I mean, when you're going through what you had to go through, that radical change in living, not an easy task, man. Not an easy task. But my hat is off to you. Dang. And I think well, I that's something that I feel like you, you and I bonded on. Yeah, that that like shared that shared experience of that was effing hard. It's radical. Yeah, it's radical. You know, you can't live in that space too long. It's like something's going to shift. Yeah, and you and I, you know, because it's it's hard. It's really really hard. Yeah, and um, and you and I found a way out. Thank God. Yeah, I mean, I'm grateful for that. And it's interesting. I don't know if you would echo this, but to me, I, I always use phrases like there was gold forged in those fires. Like, yes, at times I felt like it was on fire and walking through fire to get better, but it was gold forged in those fires and it came with me on the other side. And I don't know if you share that experience. Like, new Adam, yes. Yeah, new Adam learned the things that you learned going through that experience stay with you. So what did you call those gold? Yeah, there's, gold? there's, I always say there's, there was gold. You feel like you're in a fire right now. You're on fire, but there's gold forged in those fires. Like that's gold. For, yes. Yeah. So, so we would say, right. So you see gold. I love that gold forged in the fire. Yeah. And we say our dark past is our greatest asset. Oh, it's the same, sure. same, um, exactly the same road, just two different ways of saying Yeah, it. totally. And I think they're complementary too, I would think, because a lot of that Absolutely. exists. Let, let's talk for Absolutely. a second about, uh, I have so many things we could do like 10 of these, I'm sure. I would love it, yeah. man. I, I just, I love your vibe. You, you know how we connected. Yeah. I, I love. It. Yeah, well, it's funny because we went up on the phone for a while afterwards. It was just, it was yeah, good to great. disconnect, you know. But uh, I think one of the things that people in my community struggle with is they, they realize that oh, maybe they've started to self medicate and maybe it's gotten out of control a little bit, and it's making the anxiety worse now instead of better. And now there's that I have two problems, and there's the shame of the first problem. The second problem now there's the shame of oh, I, I think I also have a drinking problem now. I, I can't imagine. And maybe you didn't experience that. I guess the shame, the stigma that comes along with that, the judgments that come along. I did, with that. Yeah. I did experience that. Um, but I had somebody, a great mentor yeah. who I've told you about, and he explained it in a way to me that hopefully you and I can explain it to our, to your audience that we can maybe lose the shame if that's okay. Yeah. Right. Look, first off, it's normal for anybody to want to feel better. And, and, media society billboards movies you know it, 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 alcohol pills they're everywhere you know so, so you, you were finding you're, it's not like you're just some maniac that you were being 
taught it in some way. You were just trying to find some relief. But when if if Drew and Adam have a, a friend that's very, very sick and we have to bring him to the hospital, something's really, really wrong yeah. in some. And when we get him to the hospital, the first thing they notice is, oh my God, listen, he has 104 degree fever. We, we need to attack this first before we get to what's causing the fever. Yeah. The first thing they're going to do is put an IV in him, put a bunch of Tylenol on him, bring the fever down so now they could diagnose it. That's all that's happened, right? When they started doing alcohol and drugs, okay, now let's just take, let's take the fever. Yeah. Let's attack that. Let's, let's bring the fever down. Now the body's in a neutral state. I love that word that you use. Now let's see what's actually causing the person that want to make them want to drink. Yeah. To make them want a drug. Um, so rather than, you know, of course, yes, they're dealing with two things, but if they can look at it as it, it's a part of the process in, in anybody, yeah. right? You and I had a friend and they're sick and the fever went up. You lower the fever first, then you find out what's caused the fever. Yeah. That makes you, sense. Know, you can't, you can't do the cause. I'd love to do the cause right. first, but you die of a fever. It's funny. One of the, um, a therapist that I had for a while and I loved her, curiously, not a, an anxiety specialist, but nonetheless, we had a good connection. She was also an ER nurse for the first part of her career. And she told me in no uncertain terms, the first thing we would do if you come into the ER, we have to stop the bleeding. Before we could fix anything, if you're bleeding, we got to stop the bleeding. So I, I love how you say that. We got to, first, we got to break the fever. Yeah, yeah. guys. So, right. So what we'll do is, look, we're going to take a look at the drinking. We're, we'll detox you real fast. We're going to figure this yeah. out. Um, you know, but bear with us. You know, you, all you did was add three to five days of detox and, and, um, and we're going to get to, you know, when the drinking started and the causes and conditions, but the causes and conditions are going to lead us to also the original anxiety and the original. Problem. Yeah, yeah, I get that. So now you're being asked to do things. And I think that it's, there's really a, you know, these, these concepts, butt heads. So now I'm going to ask you to do really hard things, which is change the way you live a whole new way to, to engineer your life. Now you have to take this thing out of it. And that's difficult. You're going through the physical issues of withdrawal and the detox and all those things. You're breaking habits and you are forced to confront the very things that drove you to the behavior to begin with. So that's a tough one. You, how do you fix this? By doing hard things. Well, what hard things do I have to do? This stuff that made me have to do hard things. Very simple, yep. you know? So it's, you nailed it. Yeah. You nailed it. So it's, it's, you know, so many, it's such a cool time for us because like, you know, what we're talking about now is mainstream. We're not guys that are like, you know, in churches, basements and, and having yeah. secret rooms. You know, we, we could actually grow audiences and help a lot of people and be proud of what we, we overcome. Yeah. And also, so I've heard, you know, basically you got to choose your heart. You know, you got to choose like, like both ways are hard, like suffering with anxiety and drinking and, 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 and popping pills and, and doing drugs and hiding and lying about it and constantly saying you're here when you're there and being restless because you don't know when your next fix is and irritable and mad because you need something in you and discontent. What is discontent? Mean? It means when I'm here, I want to be there. Yeah. When I'm there, I want to be here. You're restless, irritable, and discontent. You have to, you're either, that's your heart. You're going to live like that and continue lying and manipulating and possibly going all the way to stealing because alcohol and drugs start costing a, a, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Or this heart, which is you have to find a different way, a, a peaceful way, a godlike way, a spiritual way, mm -hmm. a, you know, a healthier way of life. There's a, there's a, a, a sort of a, I mean, we're, we're familiar with each other. There's a woman named by the name of Allegra Castens. She's an OCD special. And she's, she started saying, suffer in the right direction. And I steal that all the time from Allegra. Great one. Suffer in the right direction. So, and the same thing would apply in anxiety recovery. So if you're dealing with both of these problems at the same time, I, I do say, pick your heart. It's really hard to face the things you're afraid of. You know, what is also really hard is not facing the things you're afraid of because the consequences of that are for you. They were hiding, they were deception, they were financial, they were self-esteem. For people with anxiety disorders, it's a smaller and smaller and smaller life full of restrictions. Either way you do it, it's going to be hard. So yeah. pick which hard gets you to a better place? You know what, uh, Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey? I, I'm familiar with it. It's, yeah. I can't tell you that I've read it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, still, but the, it, it, uh, it's, it's, it's very cliche, right? Yeah. It's, it's the, the call to action. And uh, so if it's, it, it's uh, 
uh, Mr. Anderson, who's going to turn into Neo in the Matrix, or if it's Luke Skywalker and he, you know, he has a, a dad that he knows is his Jedi hero, and this old man, this old wise mentor takes him on this journey. There's a call to action, and you have to learn a set of skills, be it the Force, or you have to be downloaded into the, you know, or or if it's you know Bruce Wayne and he has this call to action, he wants to he wants to avenge his parents, or if it's you're from Krypton, but it, the hero's journey is the same for all the way to, to the story of Christ. Yeah. But one of the reasons I want to bring this up was, and, and, and it's a great illustration, this one, is in Empire Strikes Back, uh, Yoda is training uh, Luke. And Luke, one of the things he does has to do is he finally has to face his heart. He has to face his problem. And, and Yoda has basically a, a setup where he faces Darth Vader. And in this training protocol, he chops off Vader's head. And he looks down in the helmet and he sees his own face. Yeah, it's him. Because the, 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 the real the hero's journey is you have to face yourself eventually. You have yeah. to face yourself. You, know, you, really, you think the problem is that dragon. You think the problem is that kryptonite. You think the problem is the anxiety. You think the problem is the alcohol and drugs. But really, it's something internal that you haven't faced. Not that you're not going to get anxiety again. Not that you're not going to want to have a glass of wine again. Yeah. There's something within that you have to face. Yeah. And that's that, you know, for us, we talk about the, in my, my realm, we talk about the fear of fear. Just be, I, I can't handle it. It's too much. It will overwhelm me. I can't do this. I have to run from it. And you, you're forced to face that and go through it and learn that, oh, wait, I was more capable than I ever knew I was. Yeah. Which I'm guessing are probably lessons you learned along the way. Wait, I, maybe I didn't have to start drinking to begin with, but this is the journey I was on. So. This is the journey I was on, and this is the path I chose. You know, I mean, I was that. Listen, I was that kid that chose Arizona State University because it was the number one party school. So I always have to look at it knowing who I who I really am. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, we could do a bunch of these, and I'll probably have you back on because I know if you're listening and you comment on the YouTube video or whatever, if you're in my Facebook group, we'll get some questions going because I I know that people are struggling with this and they feel how can I possibly do both of these things at the same time? How can I go through detox when I'm afraid of my own heartbeat right now? And it seems like a, a tremendously daunting task. So to have somebody who can hold up a light to say, listen, I was there. Yes. Uh, and and I, I know it seems impossible, but you can do it. You know, I, I welcome the voice. So Both of us, both of us, you know, Joanna, I, um, you know, my podcast will be starting soon, but oh. aside from that, obviously I'd love to have you on as much as I can because yeah. my audience you know, your audience may dig me. My audience will love you because I, I've i never met one alcoholic and addict that didn't suffer from anxiety. I, yeah. I haven't. Not That's one. Crazy. Yeah. Not one. Really. Right. Comorbid. Comorbid there. For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Not one. Yeah. Not one. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, obviously it starts with fun, right? It always starts with fun. Yeah. There was, there is eventually an underlying symptom that, that that's there and it's fear. It's always fear and anxiety. Yeah. Always. You yeah. Know, fear, anxiety, and resentment. So I'm going to have you on a button, but uh, I I'm very aligned. And, and I, I think there's a lot of good we could do. Yeah, it'd be great. We can continue this conversation for sure. Next time we'll talk about, I, I think, what happens now. You know, when we talked on your Instagram. You said, uh, we'll give you a little teaser. Next time we have Adam back on, come back and we'll talk about this. But uh, you mentioned you were having a really anxious day that day or oh. a couple of really anxious days. What now you don't have the old. I'm at 17 years. It's been a long time, but you know, the usual coping mechanisms aren't there. You've had to build new ways to deal with that when it happens. And I'd love to hear about that. We'll talk about that. I'd love to. And by the way, I love that we, that's how it started because it was, it, you know, it's not like you, even when you get to know the path and you mm -hmm. get to know who you are, it's not like you get excused from <laughs> ever feeling it again. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah, whether and see, and there you go. When you said before, it's not like you're never going to be anxious again. It's not like you're ever, never going to want a glass of wine. I'm sure you do sometimes. Of course. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't just go away. So that's the realistic ex expectations. We have a lot to talk about. It's going to be great. But thank you for coming on. I mean, I, I try, we can go for another hour, but I try and keep them about 30 minutes. We'll just do another one of these. Yeah, for sure. But uh, so tell us where, if somebody was more interested in finding you, and I, they can go to theanxioustruth.com. So this is, this is episode 254. I had to look on the screen. So go to the anxious truth slash 254. I'll put all of Adam's links, but where would you send people to find more about you? Yeah, I try to make it as simple as possible. So I'm at Adam Javelin in all platforms, you know, so yeah. from, yeah. And, and, you know, if it's Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, we're developing a TikTok, but just, you know, look me up and, and I'm, you know, I'm here to serve. I really, yeah. really am. 
Yeah, Adam has a very friendly voice, just, you know, for, for sure. There, 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 I had a little bit of trepidation when you first asked me to go on. I'm like, oh, no, it's another influencer guy. But yeah. very genuine, very down to earth, very kind. I appreciate thank all that stuff. Thank so you, man. I appreciate thanks, it. Thanks for coming on. If you guys hit the show notes, I'll come back and wrap it up in a second. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Okay, we are back. I could have talked to Adam for probably two or three hours today because the more we speak, the more I can see the parallels between what he lived through to deal with his addiction issues and what many of you are working on today in terms of anxiety recovery. And if you're struggling with both anxiety and maybe an alcohol or drug problem of varying severity, there is a lot of overlap there. And there are lessons to be learned in parallel when you're working on both of those problems. So I promise I will have Adam back on and we'll have more of this conversation because I think it's one that needs to be had. And I hope you found it helpful and useful in some way, even as a starting point. And as I said during the interview, if you have questions about this or things you would like to hear Adam talk about, uh, by all means, comment on the YouTube video, or if you're in my Facebook group, leave a message there or leave a message on the Facebook post wherever you see me post this podcast episode. And I will do my best to incorporate that as we continue this conversation in future podcast episodes. So thank you so much to Adam for joining in and for contributing his voice and his experience to the community. I really appreciate that. Uh, if you want to find more about Adam, you can just look for him, Adam Jablin, uh, on any platform, or if you go to the anxious slash 254, which is the show notes for this episode, I will have all Adam's links right there. So you can easily follow uh, and check him out. And that is it. That is episode 254 of the anxious truth in the books, you know, it's over because if you're going to hear afterglow by Ben Drake, uh, Ben wrote that song a couple of years ago, inspired at least in part by this podcast. And I appreciate the fact that he lets me use it the way he does for the last several years. You can find more about Ben and his music on his website at bendrakemusic.com. If you go there, tell him I said hello, because he's a really good dude and a great musician. And uh, as always, I will ask a couple of favors. If you're listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or some platform that lets you rate or review the podcast, take a minute and leave a five-star rating. And even better, maybe write a review of the podcast if you haven't already, because it helps more people find it. And then we get to help more people, which is why I started doing this to begin with. If you're watching on YouTube, like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you know when I upload new content, and leave a comment. A couple of times a week, I circle back and interact with people on YouTube, which I really dig, and I just love the, the support and the community over there. So that's it. Again, I hope you have found this helpful. I will be back next week with another podcast episode. Don't necessarily know what I'm going to be talking about, but I will be here. And remember, every step forward that you can take today is a valid and an important step forward, no matter how small it is. I'll see you next week. No looking back or dwelling on the past You know you'll never get another chance